And we're live. Lovely. Good to be back. Day five. Yeah. People eager already logging in. Yeah. Good afternoon. I mean, you can't really bag to the best seats in a webinar, but uh, I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> I hope you've got more jokes like that lined up in your lined up your sleeve today. Don't oh, worry, Mark. You're not going to be disappointed. <laughs> I hear we managed to get a Tiger King reference in yesterday, which I'm sure amused people. Guys, if you're just dialing in, we're going to allow people a couple of minutes just to get set and dialed in. Um, so we'll kick off in a minute. You've not missed anything yet. Don't worry. Lovely, I'm back. I think I got booted out for a second from my internet. Hopefully that uh, doesn't continue throughout. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll be fun. Yeah, well, yeah, you're on your own if I do. <laughs> <laughs> You can carry it anyway, it's all right. Um, um, we'll see. Nice. But yeah, no, I'm looking, looking forward to looking at today. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, today's really exciting. Really exciting. Brings together a lot of what we've discussed so far this week. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a good week so far. Uh, pretty exhausting, but to be honest, I've enjoyed every day doing it. I think uh, we probably learned as much um, from doing it as, as, as we've been teaching out as well. I like obviously had a lot of that understanding beforehand, but it's always good, particularly when you're looking for simpler ways to explain things to other people. You, you know, the penny drops a little bit more for yourself as well when you're doing that, which is uh, very useful. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure Dale is aware of the, the Feynman technique of learning, which basically is you have to understand it so well that you could explain it to anybody uh, uh, or explain it to an alien as if they don't have any context of, of anything. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think I've done before. Uh, have you not? No, 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 I have. Yes. Oh, I was going to say, I was going to say. I'm sure you're a Richard Feynman fan. Phil, you're getting some compliments in the chat. So, uh, uh, you clearly have done something well this week, Phil. <laughs> so, guys, if you just dialed in, <laughs> you haven't started yeah. yet. Uh, but if you want to join uh, some of the other. Uh, audience members that are sending Phil uh, various facilitation or fl f felicitations and compliments, then please uh, feel free to join in or put some of your questions uh, in the Q&A section as always. Uh, we're going to give people, I think, one more minute or so just to get dialed in and get set with their lunch and all their snacks and then we'll be kicking off. You've not missed anything yet. As ever, um, all of the content will get emailed you uh, after the session, um, the deck, the video, and also um, some links or, or any additional Q&A that we aren't able to cover in the session. Great. Okay. I think the participants are still going up from what I can see there, so I'm going to just give it another, another yeah. 60 seconds. Yeah. yeah, it is, yeah. Although we might be a victim of, uh, of, of Friday, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Early weekend for some. Yeah, exactly. I'll catch up on the uh, the YouTube on Monday, clocking off at, at midday on a Friday. Yeah. <laughs> We'd never do such a thing at Hacker Job, hey Phil. No, no. We're lucky if we get up by six. <laughs> no, the work work never stops, but uh, the work's always fun. Unfair. <laughs> Uh, are we slowing down on the dial-ins a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I reckon. I reckon good to go down. Okay, guys, we are going to kick off. So thanks for joining uh, Tech Recruitment Training from HackerJob. Uh, today we are covering modern software engineering. Uh, I think this is a sub-area that we at HackerJob are really passionate about. Uh, and this is where you're going to find some of your unicorns, your purple squirrels. I was always thinking your polka dot badgers potentially. They are going to be uh, the candidates that have got these types of skills here today. Um, as ever, get your questions into the Q&A. Any help you need, uh, you can use the comments. Uh, and I'm just going to move us along on to a uh, bit of housekeeping. So I think we announced yesterday the Slack group is now live. Um, we're only able to send a certain number of requests each day. So if you haven't got your request yet, uh, don't panic, just be patient. We'll probably get those out over the course of the next week or so. 
just a reminder on those comments and questions if you're using the chat function um, it'd be great if you can make those visible to everyone by selecting all panelists and participants in that section there and just a reminder uh, we're running these we run these every day this week and also four days of next week monday to thursday with friday being the bank holiday this year um, if for any reason you're having difficulty getting on um, or want the link we sent to you just email hello at hackerjob and just to say we have been uh, overwhelmed by the positive response and feedback we've been getting from all of you. Um, so please tell your friends. Um, the YouTube series is available to anyone that hasn't seen the sessions that can do a catch up. Um, you can also mention us on Twitter with the handle hackerjob underscore co. Uh, and of course, if you're active on LinkedIn, feel free to tag any of your favorite panelists um, or share the link to the, the sign up and the webinar. That's there, and we, we've now really excitedly got um, our own hashtag, so hashtag uh, tech recruitment training or the shortened version of hashtag CRT. Um, so just say, I'm your host for today. I'm Dale, I look after the product team, and we're joined by Phil and Mark today. So Phil for the fifth time this week, and Mark is back again with us. Um, what a treat. Uh, and Daisy is always going to be looking after some of the moderation and making sure we stay on track on things. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking, where is Darren? I'm missing Darren. <laughs> um, and that you're missing his charm and insight, which he's offered four days a week. So Darren is taking a very well-earned uh, rest this week. Um, but if you're missing Darren, um, you can do that catch up over the weekend on that YouTube series. So don't watch BBC iPlayer, Call the Midwife or Fleabag. Fleabag, uh, why don't you watch four hours and five hours, including the day session of Darren and the team um, giving insights about tech recruiting. Yeah, Darren's kind of conversation that actually looks looks like a, a pretty good webinar as well. If anyone wants to. Oh yeah, so we'd give it also, the other antidote to um, Darren Ellicott uh, withdrawal symptoms is to join our candid conversation session, which I believe is going on. Uh, when is that going on, Mark? Do you know? Yeah, 3 p.m. today uh, with Ed Oise, who is the head of TA over at UView. Um, and they've been they've been on a really interesting journey through COVID. Um, so she's going to be talking a little bit about that, her background, how she got into recruitment, to launch our new podcast series. So really, really excited about that. Super. So that's the way to get uh, back in touch with Darren. <laughs> uh, so here's the agenda we're working through thus far today. We're on modern software engineering. It means it's Friday, end of the week. So guys, thanks for all of you sticking with us uh, through some quite technical content, to be honest. And then just an update on the agenda for next week. So Monday to Wednesday, we'll be looking at uh, primarily on DevOps um, related subjects. But we've just done a tweak for Thursday. I think we alluded to yesterday is going to be an introduction to data science, um, which was one of the most popular um, subjects requested. And I think we're putting links to the, to the poll where you can vote for um, other subjects as well. Just a reminder, points mean prizes. So every day we're running a quiz, uh, which I think the link for which is going to go into the chat any minute soon. And the person that scores the most uh, over the course of the two weeks gets a £500 Amazon voucher, so not to be sniffed at. And anyone that attends six out of the nine courses this and next week uh, gets an invite to the next Hacker Job Wine Club, where you get some bottles of wine sent to your house and invited to join a sommelier's uh, a live analysis of those um, wines over a Zoom chat. Speaking of the quiz, um, we had uh, quite a lot of demand to see the leaderboard. So there are a select group of very informed individuals who have managed to score 40 out of 40. So four points thus far, but still with five quizzes still to go, all to play for. I think there's quite a few people that are hot on the heels um of these guys so um if you're in this list don't you can't rest on your laurels there's quite a lot of competition coming up behind you as well so without further ado uh we're going to hit the agenda and i think we're handing over to mark first so mark walk us through uh, the content for today yeah thank you dale so um really really excited about today's topic i think um we use the phrase modern software engineering a lot at hacker job um but it's not necessarily like a, an industry standard term. So Phil's gonna start by giving a little bit of an overview of what we mean when we talk about modern software engineering. Um, we're then gonna jump into what we see as the, the three sort of um, new languages or, or languages that are being used in kind of new ways. 
um, and Phil's going to take us through those use cases. Um, I think Dan's already mentioned um, in the chat about talking about our personal journey from PHP to Go, so we can, we can give a bit of an overview of that as well. Uh, and there's a couple of other languages we'll mention um, that we're seeing a lot of traction with at the moment. Um, and then we're going to move on to uh, some modern concepts. So we're going to answer some of the Q&As that we've received throughout the week around concepts like multi-threading and concurrency. Um, and then we're going to jump through to microservices, cloud computing, distributed systems, and, and non-functional requirements. So um, hopefully it's a really nice evolution from everything we've been through today. Uh, oh, sorry, been through this week uh, before we end with a couple more crowdsource challenges. So I believe um, Phil is going to take us through uh, a bit of an intro to modern software engineering. Great, thanks, Mark. So introducing Phil. Do we need yep. to click on one more? Yeah, if we skip on to the uh, the next slide. Right. So. What is it? Um, so it's an incredibly broad subject, but loosely it refers to modern advances in technology, primarily driven by the adoption of DevOps and Agile culturally, um, as well as advances in cloud computing and architectural structures. So as Mark's kind of touched on, it's not necessarily an industry standard term, but it is something that we hear from clients a lot. You know, we want someone that's working with modern tech. We want someone that's got a modern stack or have, is working with modern responsibilities. So it can be hard to define what's modern to one client might be different to another client, but loosely, and you'll see as we go through this, a lot of what we're talking about is related to DevOps culture, agile culture, and non-functional requirements. So that's kind of making sure things are scalable, making sure things are secure, making sure that the system has good availability. We'll come on to exactly what that means uh, as we go on. Um, but it's kind of a loose collection of uh, both tools and processes that contribute um, to, uh, to kind of non-functional requirements and, um, you know, as, as a result of, of these advances as well as the, the culture that you've brought on within the business. Cool. Uh, next right. one, please. Lovely. So, Scala first. So, Scala is essentially short for scalable language. Um, so, again, straight into that scalability uh, requirement. You'll hear that throughout the, the, the entirety of this, uh, this presentation. So Scala in general is a, gen a general purpose programming language. Um, so it combines both object oriented and it is also highly functional. So first of all, I, I guess to explain what object oriented programming and functional programming are. Um, so OOP, which is what you'll tend to see on CVs, uh, is a way of writing computer programs, which is using the idea of objects to represent data and methods. Um, so usually computer programs are just a list of instructions to the computer, telling the computer to do certain things in a certain way, which is called procedural programming. So in a very, very basic sense, OOP or object oriented programming, you're telling the system what to do. You're giving it a set of instructions focused around the objects that you've listed. Um, when you're looking at functional programming, it's basically the opposite. So you give the system a desired outcome um, and you let the system decide the best way to get there. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you'd want to add anything on that. No, I think spot on, Phil. I think we'll, we'll jump through quite a lot of these modern languages um, can be used in both ways. So again, when you're speaking to candidates, it's interesting to understand are they using Scala in an OOP way or a functional way? Because um, quite often if, a, if an engineer started to use languages in a functional way, they, they might want to stay with that, which is still, Phil, I would say probably less common than, than OOP. Um, but something to be aware of that a lot of these languages have you know, are relevant across multiple programming paradigms. Absolutely, I think part of that, um, and to be honest, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, so happy to be challenging, part of that is probably just the adoption rate. Um, you know, a lot of current systems will already be written in OOP. Um, we all know how tricky it is to find developers to kind of just do a system rewrite. Everyone wants to be working on Greenfield projects. Um, so I think over the next few years, you'll see more prominence of functional programming, um, but that's without you know, going really in depth, I'm sure there are still some cases where OOP is, is the way to go um, when programming. Cool. Um, so to move on to JVM. Just so quickly, just quickly uh, Phil, back on, back on Scala, we've just had a, we've just had a question come in, um, which I think is, you know, really, really interesting. Um, Jonathan's asked, can Scala be a replacement for Java? So in... And again, I'm not going to claim to be an expert here. In certain cases, absolutely. Um, we, we definitely see companies uh, using Scala not as a uh, data engineering language, which, to be honest, is um, probably where you see it more commonly. So when you're looking at, at Scala engineers, you will see a lot of data engineers using, using Scala. But I know 
Depop and a couple of other companies we've worked with recently are using Scala uh, to build kind of web applications and, uh, and build their internal applications. So absolutely you can, um, but Mark, you might have more context on whether you can in all cases or whether there are some cases where you would want to stick with Java. Yeah, I think I think Phil, you're spot on what you said, right? We, we predominantly use, uh, see Scala being used in the data engineering world, um, which in that case, um, you're probably using it instead of maybe Python um, yeah. uh, within data engineering. But I think why the question's probably been asked is, um, and I think Phil, you were just about to allude to this, is the fact that it's built on the JVM. So yeah. it might be, might be worth giving some context for about what we mean when we say the JVM. I think uh, uh, we've got to stop using our... Um, uh, initials and anecdotes uh, but uh, yeah maybe it's worthwhile giving a bit of an overview of what what, what is the JVM and why is Skyler related to Java through that yeah absolutely so yeah and, and we're gonna see this on the uh, with Kotlin as well so it's definitely worth going into it so a JVM is a Java virtual machine um, so basically it enables a computer to run Java programs as well as programs written in other languages that are then compiled into Java bytecode, which is essentially a machine, uh, a machine language. So it allows you to run Scala, to run Kotlin, um, and then that will compile them into bytecode, and it allows you know, your, your, your JVM to, uh, to run various different languages, which is why you'll see Kotlin, Java, Scala, very associated, that they're a broad, um, broadly associated. I mean, in the same way that you'll see Kotlin used widely for, for mobile, particularly Android development, um, and obviously we touched on the other day that Java is heavily used with, alongside Android SDK for Android development as well. So they have a lot of similarities um, and the fact that they, they're both built on JVM and both compile the bytecode um, is, is, is the kind of the main reason behind that. Nice. Cheers, Phil. Great. Okay, so, um, and yeah, um, as we see there, Scala can be used to build both web apps and in data engineering. Um, and you've got some of the key frameworks there as well. I think one thing to highlight, uh, which kind of reinforces the, the point I've just made, is that you will see Java developers that don't necessarily have Scala that have experience using Acker and Play as well. Um, because they're also associated, you can apply uh, some of the Scala frameworks to, to Java as well. Great, so Phil, I think you're gonna then talk us through Kotlin now. Yeah, so obviously we've just gone through what OOP is. Um, so exactly the same explanation there. It's a language where you are giving the, the, uh, the computer instructions based on the objects you've defined, the classes you've defined. Um, it might be that in future we do a whole presentation on OOP because it is a, a very broad subject, but you know, on, on the base level, um, it's, it's object oriented and you're giving the computer instructions. Again, built on JVM. Um, so you can code in Kotlin and that will then compile it into Java bytecode, machine, la machine language, which will essentially give the computer the correct instructions. Um, and then, yeah, we've already touched on as well that it's used to build web apps as well as Android applications. Um, it's more commonly used in Android applications, to be honest. Um, and it's now the recommended language by Google for Android. So you can see just how powerful it is um, and how quickly it's been, been adopted, as well as, you know, why you will typically see it associated with a Java developer. And then finally, a uh, nice, little, nice little addition to it. All Java frameworks uh, will, are compatible with Kotlin, will work in Kotlin. So if you've got an expert in uh, the Spring Framework already and you're looking to onboard Kotlin as a tool, the good news is a lot of your Java devs are going to have a lot of that knowledge already. So all you're having to actually do is teach them the Kotlin syntax. The rest of that kind of environment and, and that Java world uh, will bring a lot of transferable knowledge over to them. Great. Thanks, Phil. And so with both these, the Scala and Kotlin having this relationship to the JVM and Java, is it typical that we're seeing uh, software engineers with Java backgrounds and add these skill sets to their to their portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, Java was, was the area I actually recruited for for a long, long time. Um, and when I first started out, it was very rare to see kind of Scala on the CVs and Kotlin on the CVs. Over the past five, six years, that's definitely increased in uh, um, in number. Still not, not exactly the easiest to type of developer to find at all. Um, but yeah, 100%, you see that transition. And that's not to say you can't transition from other languages. I think a lot of what we've talked about this week when we've been looking at recruitment challenges is kind of changing hiring managers' mindsets when it comes to learning new skills. So C Sharp has very similar syntax to Java. So again, there's a link there. If you can learn C Sharp, you can learn Java quite easily. Once you're in that Java world, then Kotlin and Scala are on a million miles away in terms of understanding how the frameworks work and things like that. So 
um, yeah, th there's, there's absolutely a, a correlation there. And, and just quickly, before we jump on, um, there we had another question from the audience. So uh, Anthony's asked, um, what's the purpose of JVM? Um, and why not just stick to programming in Java? So I think what's really important to note is that the that Java itself uses JVM. So the Java virtual machine, as Phil was explaining, is is used to turn sort of Java code into uh, as part of the compiling process. So when you turn any programming language, it will get compiled into code that is at a machine level, binary, noughts and ones. So um, you can absolutely use, well, and by, by using Java, you'll be using the JVM. Java runs on the JVM. I think why we're seeing Scala and Kotlin used is those languages just have advantages that you can't do in Java. So um, as Phil was saying with Scala, it's designed for really high scalable systems. So uh, Phil referenced Depop is, a, is a, um, a company that uses Scala. You know, they've got you know, tens of millions of concurrent users, so they need a language that can scale. Likewise with Kotlin, um, particularly used in Android, I think it's given um, engineers a lot more uh, flexibility in how they build an Android application rather than using the Java and, and Android SDK. So, so Java absolutely runs on, on the JVM. Um, and you know, Java is obviously still an incredibly popular language, but Scala and Kotlin just does some things that, that Java isn't as good at. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Sylvia actually touched it on, on it the other day. Um, so I think C Sharp, Java, and Python, although they are very flexible, they have a lot of uses, they're not the quickest when it comes to their, their runtime. Um, so I think that's something that, that is, is important to, uh, to, to factor in. I think Kotlin and Scala uh, are a little bit slicker and a little bit quicker when it comes to how quickly they run. That's right. And so I guess a recurring theme we've got here is if you're looking for these skill sets that the dialogue have with uh, your hiring team, you know, given the scarcity of some of these skills, it might be quicker to get someone with, in, you know, beginner or, or relatively low level understanding of these and get them upskilled on the job that might be quicker actually than trying to hang on for, for your, your unicorn type candidate. Absolutely. If you want, if you want a team of 10 Scala product engineers, like even in the best of times, you're going to have to be prepared to wait a little bit. Um, you're not going to pull them out of the, you know, from under the, the sofa cushion or anything like that. Um, whereas, you know, if you, if you're looking for maybe two or three, senior scholar engineers to lead the way and set the tone and make sure everyone's on board and then you're looking at talented job or engineers that you're happy to upskill uh that would kind of be my advice really if you're looking at say a, a you know take 10 as an example a, a new team that you want to use scholar obviously that might not be the way that that works for businesses if you are going to look for that many scholar engineers you know you will have to be a little bit more patient than if you're willing to bring on java engineers and, and upskill Got it, so those options there. Great, Phil. So let's move this along. Tell us about Go. Lovely, yeah. So Go, again, um, as we can see there, is uh, both object-oriented and highly functional, um, heavily influenced by C. Um, so Go, or Golang, uh, as you'll also see it called, is a robust system-level language uh, used for programming across large-scale network servers and big distributed systems. Um, so the link kind of back to C. So C is a language actually from 1972. Um, so one of the, the oldest languages out there really. Um, but it still holds relevance today due to its specialism in systems programming. So um, we can see that the, the link there, obviously Go is a robust system level language. So when it comes to actually system, um, systems programming, uh, kind of C and, and then the evolution into Go uh, makes a lot of sense. Cool. Nice. And just uh, just there before we jump on there, Dan asked earlier um, about hacker jobs transition from PHP to Go. I'm not sure if, um, if Sylvie touched on it earlier this week, but I guess, yeah, just a quick summary. It was Dan and I were actually speaking to Vlad, our head of engineering, about this um, last Friday about how, how the, the transition's gone. And just to show that we practice what we preach, um, when we built that team, no one had any commercial experience with Go. So we absolutely practice what we preach at Hacker Job, and we just hire talented software engineers. Um, and the new product we've released this week um, is now completely all of the back end microservices are all written in Go. Um, the reason why we chose Go was its speed, um, and it's created by Google. So you can imagine the scalability that is available with Go. But um, anybody that's used our new sourcing platform will appreciate just how fast everything loads. Uh, Vlad, our head of engineering, was saying, actually, the pages load quicker than the time it takes to send a request to Dublin, which is where AWS are, <laughs> and back to London, uh, which is what you're talking about, milliseconds. So that's why uh, people are using Go. 
in terms of our transition uh, and why we were discussing it last Friday, is there's no real place online um, for engineers to, to learn a language that, when they're experienced engineers. So uh, Go has what they call the Go Playground, which introduces you to the syntax, um, but it doesn't, uh, it's not very complicated. So our approach was to do pair programming, uh, where engineers paired up together so that they could challenge each other. Um, and then um, actually this sprint, um, we're basically working on uh, refactoring and creating our coding standards for Go, because any programming language can be used in, in lots of different ways. So something we're exploring is, is how can we facilitate senior engineers to learn new skills, because it really helps solve those recruitment challenges. If we can support businesses that are using a Go or Scala, hire really talented engineers and then give them an environment to learn, um, we think could be really, really exciting. So there's no you know, silver bullet to it. Um, and I think Dan's just said there, they've created their own boot camp at, at Bet365, which is amazing. Um, so um, I think that might be one approach that, that companies go down. But I think it's a really interesting challenge about how you take senior engineers on this journey. Um, yeah. Because a lot of it's at the moment is self-taught and self-driven. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and I think uh, the other thing that from our, our hiring perspective is that offering the chance to upskill into Go was was um, a clinching factor for us hiring a lot of those very senior software engineers. Maybe we wouldn't have been able to, to attract a hacker job because of the competition for talent. Yeah, great devs want to learn. Cool, okay, so let's move this on. Um, to honorable mentions, what are the other sort of uh, exciting uh, model languages that people might be using, Phil? Yeah, absolutely. So Rust, a uh, couple of things to touch on here. So you'll see the word concurrent there. Uh, we are going to touch on concurrency uh, very soon to kind of explain exactly what that means and why it's relevant to the, the, the modern software engineering, as we're calling it. Um, it's influenced by C++, but for anyone who was listening on Wednesday and heard uh, Sylvie talking about the, the, the downside um, of C++, which is around kind of garbage collection, so Rust is uh, syntactically or has similar syntax to, to C++, uh, but it provides memory safety without using garbage collection. So it, it kind of gets around that, that one negative um, or, or the main negative, sorry, that Sylvie highlighted with C++ on, uh, on Wednesday. In terms of the commercial use, to be honest, it's not something we've seen um, used very heavily out there. Again, happily to be disproven on that. I'm sure some of you guys may have uh, information you know within your current company or companies you've worked at in the past which are looking to onboard rust um but personally anyway i'm not sure if you, you you've noticed anything different mark haven't really seen it in in commercial use too much at this point yeah absolutely agree phil absolutely cool um closure is a, a modern dynamic and functional dialect of list of the list program uh, programming language um which is quite quite an old language to be honest um but so like other Lisp, Clojure treats code as data um, and has Lisp macro systems. So the current development process is community driven, which I thought is really cool. So again, it's a little bit similar to um, the way Go is built on an older language, the way that Rust is kind of an improvement on C++. With a lot of these languages, what we're seeing is that uh, developers are taking old languages and going, great, okay, so what was this good for? Perfect, it did this well, this well, this well. Okay, it didn't, didn't perform so well when we were looking at this sort of task or it had this kind of glitch with it. How can we fix that? And they're kind of building on top of what's already there to ensure that they're creating uh, new languages that add new functionality. Um, but yeah, what I thought was really cool about this is that the current development process is community driven. Um, so it's overseen by a, a guy called Rich Hickey um, as it's benevolent. Bene benevolent dictator for life, he calls himself. Um, so let's hope he stays benevolent, but I just think it's really cool whenever we see uh, community-driven uh, projects like this. It's similar to kind of the JS framework world where you know they've been created all over the, the globe and it's kind of a, a global project to, to add uh, additional functionality to the language, which I, I think is, is really cool. Lovely. Um, so then moving on to Haskell, which is another Sorry, uh, uh, functional programming language. Um, so it's generally, it's general purpose, uh, statistically typed, purely functional programming language um, with a type, in, sorry, with type inference and lazy evaluation. Um, so again, older language, originally uh, built in 2010. Um, Haskell 2020 is mooted to come out um, in the at some point this year, although it does seem it's been delayed a little bit from some of the research I was doing 
on the internet. Um, but that's going to add some really modern functionality. And Mark, I know you had a little bit of insight into that. Yeah, I think what's really interesting, as you touched on, is Haskell is actually a super, super old language, um, but wasn't really standardized until you said in 2010. I think what you're seeing in the functional programming community is almost like, like you touched on there, Phil, that sort of JavaScript desk community, right? Very passionate, uh, you know, engineers about specific languages. And, and you know, like, like I said, I think still the majority of businesses are working in an OOP way. Uh, but that functional environment is becoming more and more popular. And I think Haskell is absolutely one of the languages that is used, um, you know, a lot in, in, in the functional community. Absolutely. And, and then that segue is very nice in Erlang, which again, is very, very similar. So um, Erlang is a programming language used to build massively scalable, soft, real-time applications. Um, so the real-time applications, obviously, we've already kind of gone through with uh, when we talk about Node.js, so things like Slack and things like that, where it's updating. Um, in, in real time, but this is obviously uh, better for, for massively scalable ones. So when we were discussing Node.js, we discussed a single threaded application, um, which doesn't tend to lend itself to massively scalable um, development, whereas we're gonna come on to multi-threading in, uh, in, a, in a little while, which should shed some more light on that. Um, but basically, yeah, Erlang is, is used to build massively scalable soft real-time systems uh, with requirements on high availability, Availability is another keyword to keep an eye on. Uh, we're going to cover that in a, in a second. Um, and something I thought was a little bit spooky. So the first release um, of Erlang was actually 34 years ago. So a long, long time ago. The latest release was 34 days ago. Um, so an auspicious day to be talking about Erlang. <laughs> right. Cool. And I think you, you had some insight into its use within uh, telephony applications. Uh, well, I was just going to build on what you said there is, is um, it's really interesting how it's now being used across even, it, yeah, I think the initial use case was sort of telephony applications, but now, as you said, those soft real-time systems, um, quite similar to Go, I think, you know, very scalable, very fast. So any of those real-time systems seems to be a really, really good fit for, for Erlang. Yeah, definitely. Great. So software engineers um, proving ingenious at re repurposing uh, old technologies. Uh, <laughs> So let's move things along. We want to talk about modern concepts some more. Uh, I think we're going to cover here some of the, the Q&A which has sort of um, built up over the last few days and just address some of the terms we've been using um, that have been scattered through some of the explanations thus far. Um, and I think, Phil, you're, you're going to um, give us some of these definitions. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I've been touching on these as we've been going through. I uh, thought it was good to do a bit of a recap on kind of what we meant. So, as I said on the last slide, uh, we touched on some single threaded applications the other day. Um, when we're talking about multi-threading, it's the ability of a central processing unit or a CPU, as you'll see, uh, to provide multiple threads of execution concurrently. To put it simply, it can do more than one thing at once. Um, <laughs> So as you can imagine, that, that massively increases kind of the speed that you can, you can operate. Um, we see that <laughs> the explanation there ends with the word concurrently, so straight into concurrency. So concurrency is the ability of different parts or units of a program, algorithm or problem to be executed out of order or in a partial order without affecting the final outcome. So again, if you're enabling the system to do multiple things at once, you want it to be able to do multiple things um, in, in an order that maybe isn't chronological, as long as you get to the, the end result uh, that, that you need to um, in an orderly fashion and, and, and you get the, the end result you want, um, you want your system to be flexible in, in what it can do and, and when. Um, latency, so latency is the time interval between stimulation and response. So basically low latency, which is something that you'll see a lot in recruiting for finance, anything to do with kind of payment gateways, any companies. So I don't know, your world pays, your sages or your big banks that are dealing with, you know, a, well, not only a hell of a lot of uh, daily transactions, but obviously a hell of a lot of money um, where there's a lot of risk. Obviously um, people don't tend to be too forgiving of, of kind of financial institutions when they do uh, screw things up a little bit. So um, when you are, you know, working in that sort of industry, you need to make sure um, that your, your system can kind of handle what you're asking it to do. Um, so low latency describes a computer network that is optimized to, uh, to process a very high volume of data, data messages, sorry, with minimal delay. Um, so you're looking for a, a system with low latency 
which can process that data very, very quickly. Um, and then finally, load balancing. So load balancing is the process of distributing network traffic across multiple servers. Um, so load balancing improves application responsiveness as well as increases the availability of applications and websites for users. So a lot of this feeds into uh, some of the themes we've just discussed there with uh, the, the modern software engineering languages. A lot of them allow you to, uh, to solve some of the problems that you, you might um, have with, let's say, high latency or with um, you know, single threaded applications. And we're also gonna come on to some concepts which have helped enable uh, a lot of these, these concepts as well. So, very much worth knowing what they mean. You will see it on a lot of CVs. Your hiring manager might throw these words around. Um, so it's useful for you to, to absolutely know um, what, what they kind of mean. Great. So um, something that we hear a lot about is microservices. Um, Mark, inform us. Uh, they're everywhere. Uh, I think CVs or job specs everywhere is talking about microservices at the moment. Ba barely, I think, the requirement comes um, under our nose without mentioning it in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, can you talk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're spot on. It's probably the most desired concept or, or knowledge in, in back-end engineers at the moment. So I think before we give an, an overview of what microservices is, um, I think it's important to understand what was what was there before. So when we're talking about microservices, we're talking about the architecture um, of a application and um, sort of legacy applications or, um, or older applications were built in a monolithic style. So um, what we mean when we talk about a monolith um, is effectively all of the, the front end apps, the back end apps, the, the database is all stored in effectively one unit. Um, so uh, we'll come on to the, the advantages in a second, but you can imagine if you've got all of that um, code base in, in one single unit, you don't have a very scalable and flexible and uh, quick uh, solution. So um, supported by the progress of, of a lot of technologies, um, businesses have turned to a microservices architecture. So um, microservices, effectively what it does is break those back-end apps, front-end apps, databases, et cetera, into lots of smaller independent units of code. So I think there's a really nice diagram on this slide that shows you uh, the gray background's not super clear, but in a monolith, you can see that everything is sat within one gray background or one unit. Um, whereas in a microservices, that unit is broken up into much smaller services. Um, and this is now how pretty much every modern backend application is built. Though what is really interesting as it has become more popular is there is now some debate about um, the cost of managing a microservices, microservice um, and if it's really necessary. So um, I think there, if you flick onto the next one, we, we, can, we can chat through you know, what the benefits are and, and why people have done it. But effectively it touches on a lot of what we've discussed today um, and a lot of what we talk about when we talk about modern practices is built around scale it's built around speed um, so a couple of the core benefits in, in microservices is you can update individual units independently and deploy independent units of code so if you use hacker job as an example let's say we've got our sourcing platform our interviews platform and our dashboard let's just say in a monolith, when we update the sourcing platform, we have to deploy the whole application again. So we'd have to redeploy the, the interview application, we'd have to redeploy the dashboard. Now that we've broken them into microservices, when we update the sourcing platform, we can just upgrade the sourcing platform and deploy the sourcing platform, um, and we don't have to touch anything else. It gives us a lot more flexibility. One of the other core things um, that that enables is if there was a bug in our sourcing platform, obviously a hack job, we try not to have bugs, but they are inevitable as uh, I'm sure the guys covered yesterday when we went through testing. Um, it means that that bug would only impact the sourcing platform. It wouldn't necessarily impact the interviews or, or the dashboard. Um, there's, some, there's some stuff around that's easier to manage from a, you've got smaller units of code. So when you've got a new developer and you're onboarding them, um, they're going to be working on a smaller code base. They don't need to get familiar with a million lines of code in one unit. They can work on smaller bits of, of an application. And I think the really interesting part, um, and something that I think is really exciting, is each service, so each unit of code, can be written in a different language and use different frameworks, which is really, really cool, because what it means is if you've got, let's say, a search product, 
and you need your search product to run really, really fast, you might use Go because Go is a really quick language. But then let's say you've got, I don't know, for our sake, let's say you've got an, uh, a, a news feed, right? On a candidate side, we've got a, a news feed effectively. We've built that in Node.js because it's a real-time application. Updates automatically in the browser without anyone having to refresh um, their, their browser. So what's really cool about microservices is that you can use the best technology for the best service, depending on what you're, you're looking to achieve, which I think is really, really cool. Um, but, and there's a big but, uh, and as I was saying, the debate's really interesting. As you go down a microservices architecture, um, the complexity increases. So it's a given that really, if you're working in the microservices architecture, you'll need a DevOps team, which we'll come on to next week, to orchestrate the different services and, and get them communicating together through sort of RESTful APIs. Um, and some people in the industry are saying it's too much work. Actually, yes, in some cases, a microservice architecture is good, but it's not necessarily the go-to. Um, interesting debate, as it always is in, in the software community, but I think certainly from what we see is, it's now kind of a prerequisite that if you're hiring back-end engineers, they'll be working on the microservices architecture. Yep. Great. Thanks, Mark. That's, uh, I think, a really thorough explanation. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm sort of providing the light, light relief here. So, what if I told you cloud computing is like renting a car? Um, what is it like renting a car, cloud computing? Uh, what, what an analogy, Dale. I don't know where you find these analogies. You and Phil with your stories are just excellent. Uh, is it like renting a car? Yes, there's definitely some similarities. Uh, if yeah. you skip on to the next one, Dale, we'll give, we'll give the historic overview as well. Because um, I think it's really important people understand what happened before the cloud. Um, so if you were building an application in the early noughties, um, you would have had to have on-premise servers. So... Uh, and, and you still see it in our office, we've got a server room. Uh, doesn't have any servers in it anymore, uh, but most offices would have had a dedicated room that had been really air conditioned to have all of your servers. And the challenge, uh, the, the best analogy I've got for you, Dale, about the challenges with on-premise servers was if you're a seasonal business. So let's say I'm selling ice cream online. Probably not a real business, but let's just say I am. <laughs> through, through the months of October and March, I'm probably selling very little ice cream. But through the months of April to September, I'm probably selling a lot of ice cream, which means through the summer months, my demand and my traffic goes up. So I have to have enough servers on premise to handle the peak demand, which might be due July or August for, for ice creams. But when I've got no demand, I've still got to manage and run those servers. So the cost is constant, a bit like owning a car, Dale. Um, so uh, that's where the analogy comes from. Now, in 2006, 2007, Amazon spun out uh, Amazon Web Services, short for AWS, and released what was EC2, that uh, was their first product. And that was the start of cloud computing commercially. Um, and what it did, basically, was Amazon basically built huge data centers, so they've got one in Dublin, um, and uh, the huge data centers are owned by Amazon, and then they are delivered over the internet. So you don't have to own the physical server anymore. You can buy as much or as little as you need and you can scale it as much and as little as you need. So in the ice cream example, I could have very few EC2 instances set up in the winter months and pay very little then and then scale it in the summer months, all delivered over the internet. So that is cloud computing. And as I said on, uh, I think Monday or Tuesday, the best book on cloud computing, if you really want to go deep, is the MIT Essential series. Um, it just gives such a great overview to, to non-technical people on cloud computing. It's 150 pages, and it's a brilliant series. I checked out this week. They've added loads of new books, um, and it really gives a, a great overview. So if we flick on to the next one there, I think we can jump through a few of the benefits. I've already kind of touched on them um, already, but... Um, you know, the, the core, core benefit of, of cloud computing is that scalability piece. You scale up and down the, the computing resource as you need it. And what we'll talk um, about next week with DevOps is automating that process. So it's not someone saying, I need to buy 10 more EC2 instances. You uh, have auto scalers and auto loaders that will do that whole process for you and spin up a new EC2 instance. So you've got it and then spin it back down. And naturally because of that, you've got a big benefit on, on costs. 
Um, you've also got the benefit of upgrading over the web rather than having to physically upgrade your hardware. So it was a game changer for building applications. And, and since then, you've got Google Cloud Platform by Google um, and you've got Microsoft Azure for Microsoft are the, are the big free players. Um, certainly AWS is still the market leader and Phil, I think probably we see AWS still being used by more candidates than any other. But I think Google and Microsoft have done a lot over the last couple of years to, to kind of narrow that gap. Yeah, and then obviously there's, there's kind of private cloud as well. So we've just had a question through from uh, Gail Solomon. Are there other companies providing cloud computing besides AWS? So I think you've touched on obviously Microsoft and Google there, um, but we sometimes hear requirements for private cloud as well. Yeah, uh, which is really interesting. So by default, uh, sort of an AWS is, is a public uh, cloud system. Um, and then there's a lot of debate around security. Generally, uh, AWS is, is very, very, um, a, a very secure system. And Capital One was one of the first banks to move on to AWS uh, and did so very, very successfully. Uh, but sometimes people want private clouds, um, which is effectively uh, building your own cloud system. So I think I might, I know we're not working with them currently, Phil, but I might be, might be right thinking Sky use a private cloud rather than, than AWS, or certainly did for a while. Yeah, I think we've had a few uh, requirements recently for experience with some sort of, uh, of, of private cloud. Um, but it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because if, that, if that's something you've built internally, there's no uh, guarantee anyway that someone's private cloud experience is, is that relevant to the, the kind, of, kind of private cloud that you're looking to build. Um, but yeah, we, it, it is definitely something we've seen. I think Sky is, is one to touch on here. Nice. Yeah, interesting. I, and I guess the, the car analogy works to some extent um, because you're, you're, you're going to keep on benefiting from that, that cutting edge um, knowledge and configurations that the that companies like those big three uh, are going to keep on updating. And uh, I'll give you a little anecdote about the, the no need for physical um, uh, hardware. I once worked on a systems integration project with a, a financial client in the north of England. Uh, and the, the head of infrastructure there would always refer to tin on ground. Um, <laughs> So, uh, one for our friends in, in the northwest of uh, the country. Our friends, uh, um, so, uh, my job to keep things moving apace. We've got another 15 minutes to go. So, let's see what's next. So, we're now going to talk about distributed systems, which is something quite um, related to some of the topics we've already discussed, right? Yeah, absolutely spot on, Dale. So I think it's just an evolution of, of the two com concepts we've just discussed, microservices and, and cloud computing. So. Um, effectively, what you're doing in a, when you're, you're building a distributed system or using uh, that um, sort of N-tier architecture, it might be called, um, is effectively hosting uh, different components of a system on different, now this is a, obviously a jargon word, computational entities, um, which basically means you're hosting different uh, parts of a system on either nodes um, of a system or on separate computers um, with their own local memory. So, um, for those of you that were early on Twitter uh, back in 09, 010, um, uh, there was a time when Twitter, you'd quite often go to use it and you would see the fail whale, uh, which basically meant too many people were using Twitter at the same time. So uh, one of the benefits, and I'm sure Twitter used multiple different technologies to solve that problem, but one of the things they did was build a, uh, a distributed system. And we'll talk through some of the benefits of that in a second, but effectively it allows you to share the load across multiple computation um, units or, or at that point computers. Um, something you'll often see um, when you're looking at distributed systems um, is message queues. So these different systems need to be able to talk to each other. And the way they do that is through message queues. Now message queue as a technology has been around for a long time for, I don't know if you know how long, but ActiveMQ was, uh, I think very popular, you know, decades ago. So it's been around a while. And then you had RabbitMQ come along. Kafka's kind of taken the storm in the distributed world, um, which effectively, like I said, allow each of the nodes to communicate with each other. Uh, it can also be done through HTTP requests um, or RPC connectors, but I think predominantly feel we see it done via message queue systems. Yeah, we've seen MQTT pop up a little bit recently as well in terms of a message queue and system. And then I think with the HTTP requests, you need to use them, sorry, in conjunction with a load balancer. Um, so I actually did a bit of research for, for one of our clients recently. We were looking for, they, they were talking about their internet stack. Um, so basically how they prioritized uh, tasks um, that, that were coming through on HTTP requests. And they were using that, this was a, a node focused uh, company or JS focused company. They were using it in conjunction with 
uh, Nginx or Nginx, <laughs> yeah. um, which is a, a load balancer that you use within, uh, within JS. Yeah. And I think in terms of distributed systems, I think just to touch on what Dale said, you know, pre by definition, every microservice really is a distributed system. But I think when you're talking about distributed systems uh, from a recruitment perspective, you're normally looking at distributed systems at scale. So it's not just building a microservice, it's, you know, handling thousands, tens of thousands, millions of, pro, uh, of, of requests, a, a, you know, a second. Um, so you look at the big consumer apps like a Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, you know, that is uh, one of the core needs. And I think Phil, from what we saw, obviously um, we did a lot of work with Apple a couple of years ago, um, is that it's, there's not many businesses you can hire from if you really want to do true scalable distributed systems experience. Um, so, from, I think a lot of businesses conflate distributed teams with distributed systems. Uh, just because your team is distributed across different offices doesn't necessarily mean you're running a, a highly complex distributed system. And yeah, it was something tricky that we, we, we had to work over, yeah. Nice. And a good, just next slide there, just a couple of quick benefits. I think we've touched them all already, but um, to use the Twitter farewell example, there's no single point of failure. So you've got that spread across multiple uh, nodes or computers to be able to do it. Um, something that uh, I wasn't actually aware of as a benefit until, as Phil said, we always do a little bit more research into these areas before these sessions is this durability piece, which is the idea of making backups effectively and actually on a distributed system, uh, system you can set up so it's continuously making copies of data. So the, the backup um, of the system is, is, is more robust. Um, and, you know, the key word for, for modern software engineering is all around scalability. So as more users use the internet and use our web apps, et cetera, et cetera, uh, everything needs to be built with scalability in mind. And, and again, that's another core benefit of distributed systems. And here, one of the big objectives for business is also the, the cost. We've talked about AWS and the other, other cloud computing services. Um, optimizing those costs is, is a big part of this as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And especially with cloud computing, I think that really was a game changer. It meant the, the barriers to entry for building a, a tech business dramatically reduced. Um, so I think that you know cloud computing was huge in reducing uh, startup costs and then running costs from that point on. And you're seeing it with distributed systems as well. I think um, probably one of the challenges of distributed systems is again, you need highly, highly skilled people to be able to run these teams effectively and run these technologies effectively. Um, and if you can't find them, then the, the cost benefit probably isn't worth it. But um, as a lot of these tech, uh, what they have done is, is drive down that cost base of, of managing your operations, which uh, ties in really nicely to what we'll talk through about DevOps. Um, next week because you know DevOps is a big focus on speed and quality but as a byproduct you're also um, impacting costs significantly in a, in a positive way. Cool so um, a lot of these guys you, may, you might find increasing on the contract market as well but maybe even worth paying that premium for, for that really experienced hire that's going to reduce your, your, your outgoings on a monthly basis. Yeah, and the contract market is an interesting one, right? Because obviously, you know, IR35 was meant to come in and then uh, at the 11th hour got pushed back a year. But I think by that point, most businesses have decided to in-house a lot of their contract resource. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. We thought that with COVID, there might be a response to go and actually use contractors for short-term projects. But we've not really seen that, Phil, have we? I think one or two businesses have. But I think probably people have just made such an effort to be IR35 compliant. <laughs> they don't want to now go down the route of bringing on a day rate contractor and somebody in your team going, you just insourced me. I'm not sure I'm happy of that person getting like their six, seven, 800 pounds a day. Uh, but yeah, Dale, anytime you've got a niche skill and the supply or the demand far outweighs the supply, you, you build a contract market because of economics and, and how it works. Um, but interesting to see how IR35 is impacting all of that. Yep. Right, okay. So I'm going to move things on. We've got just under 10 minutes remaining. Uh, we just want to cover um, non-functional requirements. And I think, uh, Phil, are you taking this one? Yes, yeah, so we'll skim over it briefly. I think we've kind of touched on a lot of this as we've been going through. And I touched on it yesterday as well when we had a question about functional and non-functional non testing. Um, so functional requirements, functional testing, anything functional is what it says on the tin, does your application function? Does it do what it's supposed to do? doesn't matter if it gets there in a roundabout way and it doesn't do it in the most secure way. Um, and it does it, but it'll only do it for 10,000 users, not 10,001. Um, does it function? Great. Non-functional requirements bring in a lot of the concepts that these modern languages can deal with, that these modern concepts like microservices, uh, like distributed computing, obviously when we're looking at availability, 
bring to the table. Um, so I think it was useful to kind of reiterate these at the end. This isn't an exhaustive list. I would recommend anyone out there to go and read up on non-functional requirements. Um, whether you've seen it directly on a job spec or not, the majority of your, you know, your companies will be looking at elements of this and talking about elements of this when they're looking at the responsibilities um, of, uh, of the, you know, the prospective candidates that you're, you're looking at. Um, so yeah, I thought it was just useful to kind of um, reiterate kind of scalability, availability, reliability, security is very, very heavily linked to a lot of what we've just gone over. And these are kind of the problems that all of these modern advances are, are trying to solve. Got it. And you might see non-functional requirements referred to as NFRs um, on CVs or, or job specs as well. Um, so I think that rounds things quite nicely for us guys. In the five or so minutes we've got remaining, uh, we've got some recruitment challenges, but maybe before we dive into those, um, anything from the Q&A that's jumped out at us that we can, uh, we can cover first? I think there's been some... Oh, go on. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> I was going to say it's actually been surprisingly quiet today. We've had a, bit, uh, a few questions going to chat, I think, uh, but compared to other days, we've had very, very few Q&As today. I don't know if that's just... Uh, we've got to the point where things are a bit complex and people are happy to sit back and listen um, or, or what that is. But yeah, it's been a little bit quieter today. There's been, some, uh, there's been some good conversations happening in the chat about a couple of businesses and, and their approach, which I think we should, we should touch on in the next question because yeah. I think there's a couple of guys in the chat that have definitely found really cool ways to solve some of these problems that, that we're about to jump onto. Cool. Absolutely. So let's take the first one of these. So my hiring manager wants to use the newest tech on the market. What are the drawbacks? Might there be some drawbacks to this approach then? Yeah, so I think just to, just to build on what the guys have been saying in the chat. So, and Phil, please build on this because you'll see this uh, from a talent perspective. But, you know, the drawbacks of using the newest tech is that the supply of talent isn't there. You know, you can't say that we're going to build a system using Rust and then command five years commercial experience with Rust and, and all of th these crazy requirements. But really interestingly, what a couple, of, a couple of the guys in the chat have been saying is how they're now building internal boot camps to um, upskill their own team or new hires onto the latest tech. So I think that's a key thing that you need to build from an infrastructure perspective. If, if you are gonna say we're gonna use really cutting edge tech and we're gonna build stuff in Go and we're gonna use distributed systems, et cetera, et cetera, you've gotta be aware that the hiring from the external market with commercial experience and those skills is probably the wrong approach. to so what Sylvia was saying on Tuesday or Wednesday, you know, hire really smart engineers that are really passionate about those areas and then create these internal boot camps. And both companies um, from the chat are running those boot camps themselves, you know, which is, an, again, an amazing learning experience for the more senior members of the team. Uh, and I think more and more businesses would adopt it, not just to, to support new tech, but to retain employees. Like if I can go and join an organization that, you know, runs internal boot camps on, on the latest tech, I know that I'm always going to be able to further myself and learn new skills. And I think, Phil, you probably see this the most, but, you know, great engineers always want to learn new skills and new technologies. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you can never boil recruitment down to an equation. Um, but if you were looking to try and do that for this, I think you'd look at like cost benefit of deploying on time or deploying quickly and then time to hire um, over kind of time to upskill. And really, if, uh, kind of go back to the analogy I was using before. If you want 10 Scala, you, you know, you decide, right, we're going to build a new feature set in Scala. We need 10 engineers in this team. If you want 10 fully fledged Scala engineers, good couple of years under the belt, it's going to take you, it's going to take you time. It, it, you know, you might, you might have a great network. You might reach out. It might, you might prove me wrong and you might hire quicker than I would, you know, imagine. But compared to getting, say, two or three very good Scala engineers. So you do have people that know the principles and can bring those principles into your business. Because I do understand if, you know, if no one in the business has used it before, then yeah, potentially you do want to get someone in who, who knows the pitfalls. Um, but to then say the entire team needs to come in with that experience, I think that's where there's a little bit of an error there. Um, because I do think you can go out, as we've said, to the market, hire developers that have a passion for learning, good experience with other forms of modern tech, particularly if they came from a similar sort of uh, backgrounds and the syntax is a little bit similar um, and you could absolutely bring people on to learn from those more experienced guys and and eventually you know you would get to the point of having a full team that were ready to work on your product and deploy your product in my opinion quicker than if you just went for all the unicorns but having said that i don't know all of your business needs and i'm sure there are <laughs> instances where you do need all those unicorns but yeah in general i think there's absolutely room to upskill and just quick 
Just quickly, Dan, I'm conscious of time, but we've just had a, a Q&A come through, so maybe we'll skip the second uh, crowdsource challenge. Yeah, no uh, but Phil, I think this is a really, really good one. Um, does it matter if the candidate has Azure, so Microsoft Azure, or Google Cloud Platform, and the hiring manager is looking for AWS? So we're talking about cloud platforms here, which I think is a really great question. Yeah, so I think uh, short answer, I would say, is in general, no. I think GCP, or Google Cloud Platform, is probably a little bit closer to AWS. Um, than, than Azure is. And what you'll typically find with Azure being Microsoft, typically that's going to be coming from a, um, a .NET house or a C-sharp house. So that might add an extra little level of complexity if that person has been very, very C-sharp focused their whole career um, and you need someone to come in immediately hit the ground running. Um, then yeah, maybe there's an added concern there. But in general, what we found is a talent DevOps engineer is a talent DevOps engineer or a talent software engineer is a talented software engineer. Um, so if you've mastered one cloud platform, it's not a, a big task to, to kind of go ahead and, and learn a new one. Amazing. And sorry, Dale, the, the questions are now flooding in, you know, just as we, just as we, <laughs> went. just quickly, Phil, because uh, I've got a quick take on this next one, uh, though I might, might have slightly missed it, but um, basically somebody is saying that they were using serverless technology. So I assume when you say that you're talking about like AWS Lambda, Phil, I think is probably the biggest serverless app that we see. Yeah. Um, and they were saying that they were using that in a small startup, which obviously made sense to, to deploy features quickly. Can it be viable at scale? And I think absolutely we're seeing companies use serverless technology. Uh, so Lambda, I think is, uh, AWS Lambda, Phil, I think is the most popular we see um, at, at super scale. So yeah, absolutely. You can, you can use um, serverless tech at, 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 at a mighty, mighty scale. We'll touch on it next week when we go into DevOps. Um, but it is certainly one of the more interesting technologies that have been built in the, in the last couple of years, serverless. Yeah, and then just maybe 30 seconds on the, the last one, so I just think there's one, one important thing to highlight on it. <laughs> cool. Is everyone using microservices these days? Phil, give us your 30 second take. Uh, most people have it on their CVs, um, let's put it that way, but I think a lot of developers these days know that keyword searching is, is typically how a lot of their CVs are found. Um, so all I would say is a word of warning, really, really dig into how they are involved in that microservices process. Are they working in a business which has adopted microservices and that's their knowledge of microservices? Have they kind of built on top of a microservice or maintained a microservice or have they actually built a microservice themselves from scratch? And obviously that depends on your business needs. You might not need someone who's built one from scratch. If you do, very, very important though, not to take that keyword um, as a, on a surface level and really dig into how have you worked with microservices, have you built them yourself. Cool, got it. Great way to finish off the session. So thanks guys. We've made it to the end of the session and um, to the end of the week. Thanks for dialing in uh, this week. We've been, say, taken aback by uh, your loyalty. I know people that keep coming back to these sessions. I'm really pleased that you're finding them useful. And we're going to look forward to seeing you uh, next week, starting off on DevOps on Monday. Um, have a great weekend and stay safe. Yeah, nice have a weekend, Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. Bye. -bye.